take our Bibles and look together in Acts chapter 21. Text is from verse 1 down to verse 14. And I've entitled this message, Bound and Determined. Never said that to anybody. You're persistent to go in a certain direction and you say, well, they're bound and determined if that's a bad thing, but actually those two words are used in my text with regard to how God himself directs the affairs of all men. Men just think that they have the freedom to choose or to direct their lives as they will, but what you're going to find is, and this is true not only just with the elect of God, the Christ is redeemed, but this is all preachers. Whatever man determines, I don't care who it is, it's going to be God that has bound them, whether for condemnation or salvation, and determine their end. That's the fight with natural minded men, because they don't want a sovereign God. Man wants to be the captain of his own fate. Just give me the wheel and I'll call on God whenever I need you, but other than that, I'm driving this thing. No, you aren't. Man proposes, God disposes, is the way the scriptures put it. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that the direction of my life isn't in my hands. You'd be like that guy that I saw a few months ago, bought this expensive, I don't know, it was a Maserati or what, and drove it off the, the lot, and he decided to try to crank it up because he heard it could get up to 180 and so many as soon as he trounced it, he went even down the street. All of a sudden, it started fishtailing, and he crashed it. There was this $500,000 car that was destroyed, and he got down the road. That's a good picture of any of us. But here, as we look at Paul, the Lord directing his steps in every way, you think about even how the determination of his being brought to Christ wasn't even in his hands. Because at the time that the Lord arrested him on the road to Damascus, he was going to arrest and imprison any that identified with the Christ of Scripture. To bind them is the way it put. And yet, on the way, the Lord stopped him, dropped him, and bound him where he could not move. He couldn't even see until it was that the Lord gave him eyes. And then sent him on this mission. He wasn't to go back and preach to the Jews. That was not the ones to whom the Lord was sending him. Because you'd think logically, well, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, and now he's converted and sent him back to the Jews. The Lord said, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles to do what? Suffer many things for my name's sake. So there again, his direction, he was bound, and the end determined. For a while, the Lord gave him great freedom to go and to preach the gospel throughout all the nations. And in our thinking, we would say, well, that's where he was best. Now, we could see him traveling in all these places we're reading about, writing letters back to the Ephesians and the Galatians and the Thessalonians. Those are all outside of Israel. And what a blessing to know that the Lord was pleased to direct that seed sown in those places for the raising up and calling out of his elect. But now comes the challenge because, again, bound and directed and determined, the Lord was directing his path back to Jerusalem, not to have a good, profitable ministry there, but that from there he should take him all the way back to Rome. And we find Paul here in this reading that we're going to read here in Acts 21, every direction, every stop, often say our steps and our stops are ordered of the Lord. But God was going to get the glory because this Paul was his bondservant to do with whatever the Lord had purposed. And from here forward, we find that a lot of these epistles that were written were written from prison. He would be bound and determined by God's direction that his time in prison be as fruitful we might look at it and think, well, he's in prison now. He's no longer free to travel. 
That was his life from here forward to the end of his life. Paul was no longer free to travel as he did. He went from imprisonment to imprisonment. And those that would have him bound thought that by binding him, they'd bind the word. You can't bind the word. And I find it amazing when I study these epistles that they wrote back. He was in prison. He was bound, as far as space is concerned, to whatever that space was in that prison, but yet none of it kept God from doing his work. In fact, God worked through it. And so, let's read this here in Acts chapter 21. It came to pass. Notice how it's put there, and after we were gotten from them, Paul was on his way back to Jerusalem. He had determined that he wanted to spend the, the Feast of Pentecost there. And we saw last time, it wasn't because he observed Pentecost, but he knew this would be one further occasion for him to preach the gospel to those that would be coming to Jerusalem, just like they did on the Feast of Passover, on Pentecost. And he was thinking in terms of, all this traveling, now the, the Lord was directing him back to Jerusalem during this time, because that would be when the greatest number would be gathered. But already the word was out there that if he showed up in Jerusalem, that they were going to arrest him. Such was the anger and spirit of Antichrist that was in this Jewish nation. They were waiting for him. And they were not going to let him go. They chased him all over the map. If you look at Wherever he went preaching, they they chased him down, and he left from there to another place. And this is like chess moves in their mind. They're thinking, we're going to checkmate him right now in Jerusalem. Little did they know that the Lord would use that to carry him to Rome. And from there, the gospel was preached. But when he stopped near Ephesus, Miletus, and he called for the elders, we read that last time. And he gave them this instruction in verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves. These were the elders in Ephesus and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God. He's reminding them whose church it is. Notice which he hath purchased with his own blood. There's a statement right there that Christ is God because who died? Christ did. But it was the blood of of God. It was God's blood. That's the thing about the death of Christ. Whose blood is it? God can't die, but that blood shed was that of the God man. And therefore effectual. It wasn't just dying and hoping people would be saved. It says there, which he had what? Purchased with his own blood. That purchase took place in the death of Christ. The redemption took place there. And therefore he's going to have everyone for whom he died. And so as he's beseeching them and pointing them to Christ, we saw last time in verse 36, when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. They're all of one mind. It's not like some of these mixed meetings where someone says, let's pray, and you don't know which God they're praying. But here was a unity before God of who they were addressing, this sovereign God through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says there in verse 37, they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him. There's going to be a separation. We, we're not going to live forever on this earth this way. This could be in how the Lord directs our paths in different ways, according to his song, or it could be in death. We don't know. For some of us here, this may be our last meeting together. We've sung praises of the Lord, we've prayed. And, uh, but how many of us think, we say, well, I'll see you next time. How many of us think that this may be the last time we'll ever meet together like this on this earth? There's going to be a separation. I don't mean that every time we get ready to leave, we're going to weep sore and fall on each other's neck and kiss each other, thinking, oh, this might be it. But there was this sense with Paul that this was it. And so... In verse 38, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake. It wasn't just over the departure, but the things that they could expect to face themselves. This wasn't just Paul, unique to him. 
but for the gospel's sake, for Christ's sake, that the Lord keep them in his grace, that they should see his face no more, and they accompany him unto the ship. So when it says there, and it came to pass that after we were gotten from them, it's like they had to be pulled apart. This was a slow walk back to the ship, talking to the things of the Lord, but at the same time not wanting to be separated. Such is the unity and the oneness, I believe, that the Lord gives with his people. We have meetings all the time in the world, and we see each other, okay, next time, Lord willing. But if you think about the fellowship of those that the Lord has brought together, this is not something that you impose on people. There's a true oneness. I don't know about you, but I love every one of you that expresses to me that the Lord has done a work of grace in your heart. There's that oneness. And it is difficult to be apart. And when we part, we look forward to being together again. And so they launched. It's not being launched on a sea of uncertainty, but launched according to God's purpose. We came with a straight course unto Kaos, and the day following under Rose, and from thence unto Patera. I know these names don't mean anything to us, but if you take the time to look them up, then you'll see that these were important ports in the shipping lanes where the ships would stop, and then if they had to change ships, it was in these places. These were places that the Lord had prospered back in the day in the world. But the key point there in verse 1 is they made a straight course. There were times when Paul set sail and the wind, the Lord directed it, and they ended up in a different place. Here was a straight course. There was nothing inhibited from here forward for him to get to destination. And finding a ship sailing over unto Phoenicia, we went aboard and set forth. Now remember who's writing this book of Acts is none other than Luke. Luke himself. So when he says, we went aboard and set forth, Luke was with him. We, we tend to forget who else was with the Apostle Paul during all of his journeys. Now when we had discovered Cyprus, you got to remember these ships, they didn't have navigational equipment. And they did have navigation. They used the stars and other things to direct. But you couldn't like we have GPS, you can actually see you're going this way and in so many hours you're going to be here. When it says they discovered Cyprus, the ship had set sail there, but this was the Lord directing it. And it's as if to say, ah, there's Cyprus. <laughs> Sometimes the ships would get off course no matter what they tried and they would try to bring it back and they would land somewhere else other than where they intended and now they have to get it back. None of this occurred. This was the Lord directing his path. He said, we left it on the left hand and sailed into Syria and landed at Tyre. Now you have to remember, this was where Paul, in the beginning, was on his way with letters of authority to bind and imprison Christians in Syria. And now he finds his way back to Syria. You have to remember, it was in Antioch of Syria that he was sent out to preach the gospel. Even though... Syria was outside of Israel, in fact, an enemy of Israel, even as it is today. The Syrians and the Israelis are in constant conflict. And yet, here's where the Lord's directing one of his servants to land specifically at Tyre. For there the ship was to unlade her burden. You think, well, it's just a normal stop. But what do you read in the next verse? And finding disciples. I often say in all of my business where I go about, I'm looking for sheep. And here, the Lord directed Paul to inquire. And finding disciples, it says, we tarried there seven days. He was, again, bound and determined to spend this time as much as the Lord would direct with these, his disciples. I know a lot of people today that like to take these cruises and go back and visit these places. I've often thought if I ever had to go back or could go back to Turkey, which is where the 
region of Galatia is, that if I had to go back and visit some of these spots, I'd be looking for some trace of somebody from back in the day that the Lord had taught and was still there today, not that they lived from way back then, but that the seed of Christ had been brought to them in the gospel. That's what Paul did here. He tarried seven days. And here's where the word was out. They knew of Paul. This, he'd been sent from there. And this gospel that God had sent him to preach was being broadcast throughout the world. They didn't even have email or internet or any of that. This was word of mouth that the Lord was blessing, but also knowing and understanding that there was trouble down in Jerusalem. And so it says here in verse 4, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. That sounds like a contradiction. Well, if the Spirit is saying don't go up to Jerusalem, then why go? But I believe the sense there is he said to Paul through the Spirit, this is warning Paul, that there is persecution ahead. There is going to be trouble. That's what the Spirit was announcing through these disciples. Not as a way to discourage Paul in any way outside the will of God. You can't. But out of love and compassion for him, to warn him and to beware. I've had people tell me that back in the days when I was traveling more outside the country. Be careful. And they'd always give you the latest news. I remember one time getting ready to go to Haiti and went to board the plane. That was when there was a lot of trouble. But the Lord gave me the determination that I needed to go. That was the last time I went because when I got there, it was on fire. And there were a lot of things that took place. But I remember as I was getting ready to board the plane, there was a sign there that says the Secretary of State of the United States is determined that it is not safe to travel to this destination. In other words, you're on your own. And I'm sure that this was in Paul's mind, even as he spoke of the sufferings that awaited him where he went. But like he said, none of these things moved me. Now where does that determination come except for the Lord giving it to him? that he feared not for his life, considered that his life was in the Lord's hands. And uh, if through that it meant death, then so be it. And so when the days, verse 5, when we had accompanied, accomplished those days, I love even how that's put. The day, how was your day today? It was accomplished. In other words, it went exactly as God purposed. How about that? Rather than, man, it's, you talk about a rough day. Don't talk to Paul about a rough day. He was beaten, 49 stripes, he was in peril on the seas and on the land and all these things. And yet in all that, he rejoiced. And I love the way Luke, word directed Luke to write it. When we had accomplished those days, there's nothing going to befall me today or has befallen me or is going to befall me tomorrow. But what God purposed it, and so it shall be. Accomplished. said so we departed and went on our way and they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city we kneeled down on the shore and prayed and again a blessed fellowship in the Lord praying together this is so much different than someone saying hey can you pray for me right now when there's not really any I get that all the time from people Are you a preacher you know, how do you pray for as if I'm some priest or rabbi or no. I've told people many a times, well, if the Lord brings you to mind, I will remember you. And that's it. So you're not going to pray with me right now, no. I know it sounds harsh, but we're not at the dictates of men to say, well, yeah, you should pray for me because that's your job. Nope. But here, how much more blessed, how much more glorious when the Lord's people meet together. And truly, they desire to pray with one another, as is described there. Kneel down on the shore and pray. It, kneeling isn't an obligation, but it is a position of submission. 
And we say, let's bow our heads and pray. That's another way of, of submission to the Lord and His will. When people say, can we pray together? Well, what are we going to pray? The Lord's will be done. That's what we're going to pray. It's not that we're going to come before God and by our petitions get Him to do what we want Him to do. That would be an idol God. But here there was already that oneness. And I love here that it was with wives and children. These were some who were also under the influence of the gospel from an early age. God had purposed this. You know, you think, well, where did they find disciples there in Syria? Our Lord never went up into this area to preach when he is on earth. And yet you read about some he brought to himself. The one lady that drew to him and, and cried unto him. She was from this area. And yet the Lord himself never went there. Well, he didn't have to. He caused his word to be carried back. Maybe even from that woman that when he said it's not good to take the children's bread and, and give it unto dogs, that she said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat of the crumbs that fall from the master's table. There's one who carried the word back there. We don't know. The Lord's going to get his word to his people in his way. And even down here to the wives and children that accompany, this was the Lord directing. And so when we had taken our leave one of another, we took ship and they returned home again. No idea whether they ever saw each other again on this side of eternity, but there was still that oneness that is the fruit of Christ's death. For he has united in one all of the children of God, reconciled them in one place, one time, through his shed blood at the cross. It's not when they believe that they're united, but united in his shed blood. And when he had finished, we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to Ptolemais and saluted the brethren and abode with them one day. The word was going ahead that. Paul is on his way to Jerusalem, and the Lord was drawing these brethren, even though separated. We talk about being separated from other believers by a great distance, but we have a vehicle. If we want to go meet another brother that may not necessarily be here in Shreveport, we can hop in our car and go visit them. There's a number that follow our services here that are within driving distance, and we know about each other. But here the, the picture is that wherever they are, the Lord is either bringing one of his servants to them or they're coming to him for their encouragement and for their blessing. And it's the Lord that determines the time. In one place it was for seven days, another day one day, as it was here. And it says the next day, verse 8, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea. So now we're back into the land of Israel. Caesarea would have been in the middle part of Israel, known in the day as being of Samaria. It was Judah, Samaria, and then Galilee up in the north, those three parts. Here, the ship landed in Caesarea. Remember, it was to the run of the Roman centurions that the Lord sent Philip. And he ministered unto those in Caesarea. And it was there that actually Philip dwelt. It says he came to Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist. That word evangelist is abused today. It means anybody in our day that goes around with a guitar or a little background music. And he's playing and producing, and everybody's coming. We're having such an evangelist, and I were having evangelistic meetings, and everybody's a whoop de do. And then they pick up that love off keep playing the music over and over until they got enough before they could leave. I have a story on that, but I'm, I'm going to refrain. <laughs> but this is where the Lord had put Philip. The evangelist means the one bearing the gospel. So a lot today are called evangelists that aren't evangelists. They're, they're perverting the word. It's any that the Lord has raised up and taught Preach the gospel. And here it says, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. When he's talking about one of the seven, you have to remember that these were preachers that the Lord had separated out 
in Jerusalem there in Acts 6 that their work was to make sure that the congregation was cared for and that they had everything that they need while others went and preached the gospel. Well, Philip, I truly believe the difference between deacons and elders is that the elders tend to be in one place. They're the ones ministering in one place. An evangelist goes out from a congregation and preaches the gospel, just like we see Philip here, that from Jerusalem now, he, he went to Samaria. And it really makes sense when you see how the Lord said that first the gospel should be preached in Jerusalem and then Judea and Samaria, the uttermost parts of the, the earth. The Lord puts his ministers where he will. Here's Philip now in Samaria. And he abode with him. Now it says the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. Here's where you have people jumping all over this and saying, see, women can be preachers after all. Because it says that there that they prophesy. Well, to prophesy doesn't necessarily mean that you hold a function as a preacher and uh, have that responsibility in the preach just like men would, other men. We know from scriptures it says that it's not permitted for a woman to speak in the congregation or to have authority to speak. And the reason is given that in the beginning Eve was deceived. And so it's part of that judgment of her partaking of the fruit and then giving it to Adam that she was no longer to ever be one to speak on God's behalf. Now, does that mean that women then can't testify? Because the word prophesy means to foretell and to declare. In fact, if you stop and think about it, the very first witnesses of Christ's resurrection were who? Were women. They're the ones that took the word back to the other disciples who came running afterwards. So it doesn't mean that the lips are sealed. No, I can't speak to you because you're a man and I'm a woman. No, it's in the sense of exercising authority over man. Here it's very evident that these were Philip's daughters yet to be married. It's a sign of virgin. They were still at home with him, but they did prophesy. And in this particular context, everything has a context. What were they actually saying? Well, they here were saying the same thing that everybody to that point the Spirit had directed to say concerning Paul, and that is, hey, there is trouble ahead. There is persecution ahead. They were testifying as the Spirit gave them utterance that there awaited him just like everything to this point, that particular suffering and persecution. Now, I do believe that none do testify except for they testify of Christ. And so in this conversation, this testifying, they would have been pointing Paul even to Christ. You say, well, he's the apostle. Why would he be pointing to Christ? Just like any other sinner, but by the grace of God. And so this is part of that common communion or fellowship that they had. Speaking of Christ, but at the same time, warning him of the particular suffering that awaited. And he says, as we tarried there many days, we've got seven days in one place, we've got one day and now many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. These are ones that at this particular time, the scriptures had not been written. And so the Lord was still raising up prophets to, again, point sinners to Christ, is what prophets do. But when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle. Don't think of a girdle like women might wear, but this was something that bound the clothing. They had an outward garment that they wore and then their undergarment, and they bound it with what is called here a girdle. But Agabus, again, being directed to the Lord for Paul's sake, took that particular girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost. So everybody was declaring the same thing. You're saying, well, what are they trying to do? Discourage Paul? No, strengthen him. The Spirit never 
does a work in any of his own, but what it is to strengthen them. And when we read in Scripture to expect even suffering and persecution for Christ's sake, as we live in this world, that's not to discourage anyone, but to cause us by the Spirit to look to Christ alone. He's the shepherd. Think of David running off the, the, the bear, slaying the bear to protect the sheep. That's, that's Christ's work as the shepherd of his sheep. But thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girl and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. In other words, deliver him into the hands of the Romans. So, there, again, nothing takes place but what God has determined. When you go back to Acts chapter 20, this is where this began. God is preparing Paul now for a different type of ministry where he would no longer be free to travel as he did. And again, by binding the servant, many thought that they were binding the word. Back in Acts chapter 20 and verse 23, you read, Say, the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city. The word was out, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But then you can see, again, bound and determined. Bound by the Spirit. But determined that none of these things should move him. Verse 24. What else is there for which I should live? than to declare the glories of Christ wherever he puts me. For some it might be an actual prison. For some it might be a sick man. There have been some of the Lord's servants over the years that have suddenly fallen sick, whereas they were free initially to preach free to the gospel, but then they were stricken and restricted in body, and yet until the Lord took them, they continued to write and to preach as the Lord directed. I've thought about that with regard to myself. We, we pass by people in the wheelchair all the time. It may be that the Lord one day strike me down to where I can't get out of my wheelchair. But as long as he gives me breath, is that going to hinder me from declaring the glories of Christ? I pray not. Here he says, none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself. There is the problem. When we begin to value our lives as they are right now, and I'll tell you, we've we receive far more than we deserve. 